This is Jobaba London. That is the best opening that you can use below 2000. It's so good to the point that every win feels as effortless as tricking police officers with donuts. Now, to prove it, I prepared uh, four model games around uh, roughly 1900 uh, ELO opponents, so let's not waste uh, any more time and dive right into the action. All right, everybody, back uh, on the grind, facing 1900 opponent from uh, Austria. All right, we're going to be going Jabava since he already played d5. And uh, yeah, quite quickly, he decides to box in the bishop. So I'm going to go uh, bishop to f4, starting position of the Jabava London end. This gives him additional uh, move bishop to b4 to pin. And uh, that is why, in general, I recommend you to learn even on knight f6 to play e3. Because having my opponent play the bishop b4, there will uh, never be an uh, opportunity to go for knight b5. So you don't want to have to rely uh, on that thing alone. Sure, you can keep that on the side if you really want to, but you want to know how to play e3 positions. And okay. Important moment, he is going bishop d6, so pretty much offering the trade. What do you think we should uh, do uh, as a reaction? So, spoiler alert, never play bishop g3. Also, common mistake, do not play knight h3. Just because we do that in the pawn storm, some people actually think uh, you should always do it. But no, remember, I always mention you do this rule in this structure. That's how you get them right. Uh, so now I'm just going to play uh, e3. I'm going to invite him to take. And uh, hopefully uh, I'm going to be able to show you how to maneuver around in uh, what I like to call the boa snake structure. So it goes knight f6. Important. Always do bishop d3 first. I'm still, you know, the offer is still there. Please opponent take. My viewers are really scared to allow the double points and I should uh, show them how to play that. Okay, let's give him one more chance. Take. Please. Leave the pawn. Give me the double left pawns. I'm gonna show how to play with that. Okay, he castles. I I'm gonna castle. Offer is still there. Will he bite? Let's see. Come on, opponent. You know you want it. I have one more useful move to make, Rook E1. I could also play A3, H3 after that. Is he gonna finally take? The only way to, like, potentially avoid this is to try and set up E5 break somehow. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna do Rook E1. I can keep going. I can still play useful moves. You'll have to take sooner or later. You can feel the tension in the air. Like you're texting a girl for like three months and you always uh, talk about setting up a date, but setting up the date in itself never ends up happening. I kind of feel like this way in this situation. I, I know he's going to take on f4. I just don't know when. And uh, he plays knight h5. He says, you go first. Isn't that move completely losing? Hmm. Okay, probably not, but uh, first thing that's on your radar when you see knight h5, there should be, okay, knight is over there, so potentially some bishop h7, uh, little Greek gift, king takes knight g5. And the only problem is that he can save up the knight uh, with king g6, I think, and that's unclear. So, all right, I mean, how do we meet knight h5 generally? You also want to look for bishop g5, and only after f6, bishop h4, g5. Yeah, maybe then play bishop g3, give him the bishop, but we could also have knight takes g5 tactic. So yeah, I'm going to go for it. You don't want to give up your bishops uh, with ease. And uh, yeah, I told you, <laughs> whenever you end up uh, talking with a girl about a date for three months, normally it doesn't end up happening, just like... We didn't get to get the double f pawns. Okay, will he play g5? I think g5 is a big mistake. But if he doesn't, then uh, his point, uh, I mean, uh, all of the previous play would have been pointless. And he goes g5. Pause the video. And 
try to find why G5 is actually, uh, yeah, not a good move. Yeah. At the very least, you could do Bishop G3, right? And get a playable game. But as I told you, there's a bit of pressure going on. So Knight X on G5, a little discovery. And uh, more important, once we take the Knight, he's not going to be in time to capture our Bishop due to the mating threat uh, on H7. So... Yeah, very important double attack. I think he's losing another pawn and uh, yeah, just like that, you're going to be completely winning against the uh, 1900s. Congrats. Just is easy. Okay, I'm just going to take, collect second pawn. I could have taken with the queen as well, just to get uh, him into the end game, but it really felt like uh, with the king uh, completely open, it's like, uh, you know, when the king has no pawns like this uh, at the castle, it's like uh, you live in London without having an umbrella. So naturally, there's going to be uh, a pin. We win even more. Uh, so, yeah. After that, I'm going to be even like more confident trading the queens. Not like I was the kind of guy to be afraid of that. And okay, opponent just like that resigns. Nice. Okay, that was actually pretty instructive in a way. Uh, I'm still kind of punching air because we didn't get to show the double f-pawn structure but at least uh, you guys are not gonna be afraid of this knight h5 uh, plan anymore so g5 knight x on g5 just like that um, and you crush your opponent like a bug after i spent quite a while uh, using my uh, imaginary degree in psychology i realized that you're probably wondering what the heck is going on with those double pawns so uh yeah, we're gonna skip the opening since uh, I already explained it and uh, we're gonna dive right into the starting position. Let's get it. Yeah, ready to take and uh, we've gotten ourselves something very nice, something very juicy, which I like to call the boa snake. Uh, okay, why do I come up with such weird names? Well, it's kind of self-explanatory for uh, the style of chess that we're gonna be playing in this position because we're not gonna be going for tricks. This is not going to be any like bing bing bang type of attack, uh, but it's going to be a slow uh, squeeze. We're going to try to squeeze the life out of our opponent like a boa snake. Okay, queen to d6. He's attacking the pawn. Now, a typical move to uh, also improve this knight would be knight e2. But then uh, there's a little bit of an issue. If we go knight e2, opponent has queen b4, which is a double attack, uh, winning a pawn. So we don't want to give him the pawn. Okay, uh, Alex Banzea, how can you recommend such bullshit? Uh, they are immediately targeting our weak pawn. That's why we shouldn't be playing this way. Well, at the very least there is g3. So we can just play g3 if we want to. But uh, I'm gonna do queen d2. Just gonna keep it very simple. Simplest uh, move in this position. They don't do queen d6 very often, by the way, but yeah, he did it. I was really contemplating between queen d2 or knight e5. I think both moves are equally good. Um, but queen d2 is just shutting down any queen b4 activity uh, because in that position you have simple move rook b1, for instance. And yeah, the queen is just uh, doing not much. Okay, b5. Uh, yeah, we're gonna finish development, we're gonna castle, do not go long castle, okay, we never go long castle uh, in the boa snake, the boa snake is very positional, we castle short, and uh, I have to say this b5 move is a little bit exotic, in a way that it's rarely played and uh, whenever they play b5, uh, this pawn can be vulnerable to uh, an a4 type of push, Trying to open up the rook and uh, yeah, well, seems to be going uh, for that uh, himself. Okay, I mean, interesting. We have many ways to play this. I think uh, knight e2, knight g3 is the simplest. However, uh, I want to let you know that uh, potentially knight a4 is strong as well because it's controlling uh, a weak square on c5. So it's fighting for that square directly. Uh, but I'm just going to do a simple move. And notice that the pawn on b4... It's already uh, not such a good point to have because it needs to be babysitted. So, yeah. 
pawn and castles. I can use that pawn as a hook now for a3, for instance. And he's unable to uh, keep it with a5 because we can take. There's going to be a problem for black with the undefended rook on a8. So a3 more or less forces him into um, allowing a backward pawn. Which is something really juicy that we can play for. Because backward pawns usually you just win them. Uh, I can also ignore play knight g3, let him do a5, let's say, and then knight e5. That's possible. Um, I'm wondering which one is uh, more uh, instructive for the video. So the thing is a3, b a, rook takes, it's a very easy win. And I think I'm just going to go for it to highlight... Uh, Oh, you can uh, squeeze the... Uh... Okay, it's not even going to be a backward pawn. It's going to be fully isolated. But it's an isolated side pawn, which means that our rooks are going to come uh, and gang up on it very easily. So yeah, has to take. Also, this is very, uh, very strong because it counters uh, Black's only idea to be fine, let's say, against the boa snake. So whenever you have boa snake structure, the only plan that uh, could equalize for black is to exchange bishops. As long as you're able to keep bishops on the board, you're going to be better because you have free attack against the enemy king. And he's yeah, almost playing down a piece. He decides to uh, go for it right now, but at the detriment of losing a pawn, so I can really just take and take back with a pawn on d3. Um, okay, I'm just going to go for uh, takes and then an AB. Seems like an easy way to play it. I'm going to go AB and he has to recapture with the queen. He will still be getting the uh, isolated pawn that we're going to play for. Taking with the knight is a big mistake. I think. Which, uh, yeah, you can try to refute by pausing the video. It's likely that he might take with the knight. Because it's hanging, but he decides to throw in knight e4. Yeah, knight e4, okay, it's a playable move, but I'm just going to go uh, back. Uh, I don't want to go to d3 because it allows uh, knight b4. And I don't want to go to e3 because after knight b4, he's threatening to take on c2. So I want to put my queen on a square that's controlling c2. And, uh, okay, after knight b4, c3 could potentially trap the knight. So we also need to control the d3 square. Because queen c1, knight b4, c3, maybe has some knight d3. Uh, which still probably lost, but just queen d1. And knight is uh, under attack, expecting him to take this pawn, but then c3 traps it. So it's probably better for him just to give up on the pawn completely and go knight c7. So, yeah, it's uh, okay. It may have sounded uh, a little bit complex. Yeah, Ooh, how do you come up with such a precise queen move? It's just a, a method of uh, elimination, as you've seen. Uh, okay, felt like there's an issue with the knight. We could try to trap it. All I had to do was look for uh, potential ways for black to save the knight. You go through the moves methodically, one by one. You see where he escapes. You avoid that, and then you get to the good move. So, uh, yeah, I I don't find that so complex as long as you approach it the right way. Hopefully that makes sense for you guys watching. Um, just going to play c3 now, connect my pawns. We literally have an extra pawn plus uh, rook a5, queen d3, rook is coming over. All I see in this position is that pawn on a7. Okay, I don't think about anything else. I see open file, I see backward pawn. Uh, okay, now after this move, this changes it. I see a uh, backward pawn and I see permanently weak square on uh, e5 because uh, it cannot uh, be protected by pawns again. Notice that these pawns have been, let's say, over pushed, but uh, yeah, I can just play knight e5 there uh, and install it uh, whenever I want. Um, I think I'm going to start with like a queen move just to connect the rooks. I can also just do like rook a5, since he can never really attack the rook. The rook is great on that square, uh, fixing the pawn. Yeah. In general, queen d3 is useful. The only question is whether 
I could want something like queen a4 instead of that, and then try to get a triple stack onto the backward pawn, which is like a standard procedure to attack backward pawns or like isolated pawns. So, uh, yeah. By the way, uh, another uh, interesting uh, idea that uh, we have is, okay, besides knight e5, it's also a question of how can we improve the knight on e2. So the knight on e2 has uh, some pretty interesting routes in this position, which, yeah, here again, you can take this as an exercise and try to pause the video and come up with ways to improve it. Uh, because, uh, yeah, we have some very juicy ideas, like get a knight to c5 or even better via d3 from where it's watching both of the weakest squares in black's camp. And okay, he's doing h6, he's trying to set up some uh, activity that shouldn't really bother us. Uh, I think uh, move like queen d3 or rook is fine, also knight e5. Yeah, I'm just going to start knight e5. So g5 is not even going to come with a tempo, because we can recap. And also, now that we play knight e5, we have uh, a way to uh, get rid of this knight. Because there is actually a very big difference when it comes to this e5 square and the e4 square. Because, okay, let's try to pause the video and think about what is that difference. Uh, Apologies if you're like a higher rated player that knows the answer to all these questions, but uh, I feel like it's really important to take care of the fundamentals, okay? So for the lower guys out there, it's really important. Uh, okay, so the answer is e4 square. We can still kick out the enemy knight with a pawn, while black can never kick our knight with a pawn. So e5 square is much weaker. e4 square is not a weak square. It's just that for the time being, yeah, we couldn't kick the knight, but in the long run, yes, we can use the pawn. So we don't really have any weak squares in this position. Even c4 uh, can always be covered by this pawn. So knight e5 and just want to do queen d3. Okay, king h7. He's just uh, trying to set up some desperate counterplay, but it has no pieces and... Uh, yeah, we should be we should be good by uh, I think uh, focusing on uh, that pawn. We should be winning it by force. The only question is, okay, can he try to set up some a6 when we double up? Yeah, maybe. Maybe a6 is not so easy to break. Okay, on a6, it would be good to have a knight attacking that pawn, so like a knight on c5. So some knight c1, knight d3. I could maybe prioritize that. Yeah, I'm just going to do it to begin with. And then f3, I can play. But the knight is landing on c5. Man, these like juicy dark squares. This is so good. Uh, yeah, I'm still considering whether I want to play knight c5 right away, allowing his knight to basically take, and then I can take with a rook, attacking this pawn, or I can play f3 before, yeah, doing the final jump. I feel like uh, f3 would be better. Okay, he starts knight b5. Yeah, okay. Fine, I'm just going to continue my maneuver. 93. This looks like a complicated position, but it's actually uh, completely winning for us. We're in full control. He's down a pawn. He has uh, obviously weak squares. Um, he has clear, clear pawn weakness. We're controlling the open file that matters. Um, well, he doesn't really have any open files. Like, this cannot really be any useful, like the B file, because um, we have this, uh, uh, I think you call it pawn diamond, right? When the pawn is defending a pawn. So his pieces would be completely shut down on the B file. While, uh, yeah, I can get rid of his good piece, then play my knight on C5. 
then uh, yeah now now that he played knight b5 the knight is uh nicely protecting but it allows rook a6 as an additional thing so he plays rook 8 i'm just gonna get rid of the knight simple move then install the knight to c5 usually the problem is that you have only one uh, juicy square and too many knights now uh, okay we have Strong square for each. Not afraid of any knight c3 sack for two pawns. We can just take and then play queen c2. He's gonna be easily losing. He's gonna have only one pawn for the piece. So uh, that is not enough. Last time I checked. Oh, he goes for it. <laughs> Maybe he knows better than I do. Okay, queen c2, as I said. Has to go back, but then uh, c6 collapses now. Yeah, I'm gonna take and for the queen trade, so... Just in general, uh, whenever uh, yeah, you're up a piece or a pawn, whenever you have a material advantage, uh, try to initiate trades. What do you think I'm going to do? Either this, but rook on b5 is already active, so I'm going to use the inactive rook for this procedure. Rook c1. Trading a pair of rooks. Yeah, he wants to keep, but... This is why uh, this rule is so powerful. Whenever he tries to keep pieces, he's giving away uh, important squares. So we can infiltrate and then uh, threatening to double up on the seventh rank, which is going to put his king under tremendous pressure. He cannot really get counterplay because uh, the rook uh, from hate cannot enter the game. Yeah, okay, I have to save the knight. Well, uh, tough decision. Should we put a knight on uh, the juiciest square uh, ever invented? Yeah. I don't know. Difficult call right there. What can I say? Okay. Um, rook b7. And he's going to play rook g8. But that probably either loses the a7 pawn. But uh, frankly speaking, uh, there should be a way to set up a mating net. Yeah, he checks me, but I can hide. He can always hide. Yeah, he goes uh, h5. Interesting. Maybe some h4. I'm gonna do it just to not give him anything. a6 targets the rook. I'm gonna go to b7, targeting the pawn whenever you can get this so called pigs. I think some people call the rooks like these pigs. Uh, yeah, that's winning usually. F simple move. Probably gonna go for it. Rook e7, the only try to escape is like rook c8, rook c2 and get some desperate counterplay, but he's, that would allow uh, rook g7, so shouldn't be in time. And, uh, oh, this is going to have a beautiful finish. Oh, boy. This is going to be rook h7 checkmate. Watch this. This is going to be so good. All right. Come on. This is going to be one of those smothered mates. Okay, you have to go there. King up allows mating too. You have to hide. Go hide. Oh no, he didn't want to hide. Damn it. Okay, we'll just have to do the simple mate then. This and... Yeah, no, simple move. Rook h7. Okay. Noise, 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 noise. Well, we got a pawn and then uh, we just uh, kept control for the whole game. I mean, got a 95, but... Yet again, from simple position, no uh, really difficult decisions. We just have to keep a uh, firm grip over the position. Just secure it. It's easy to score high accuracy. I'm sorry, everybody, but after uh, watching the replay, uh, I realized that these games were too accurate and uh, yeah, I'm just too good and uh, I have to do the procedure on myself. So as usual, block, report. And with that being said, we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, uh, we are back and uh, we're facing uh, almost 1800 opponents from Canada. Uh, okay, d4, d5, uh, meaning that uh, we can go for the job of London. Okay, all right. 
That's exciting news, and uh, we can already pinpoint that uh, my opponent plays uh, Jobava London with Bishop trapped inside the pawn chain. Uh, so, having he played Bishop f5, I recommend you uh, start uh, saluting that Bishop with pawns. So, go for the push, but on e6, uh, very important. First, e3. You don't want to rush with knight f3. You do e3 and then bishop d3, very important uh, move otherwise, because most people uh, tend to, uh, let's say, go e3 and just close their eyes, go knight f3, and uh, for instance, uh, issue with that can be, let's say, opponent uh, would have pinned, which is very common in general. You play knight f3 and all of a sudden knight e4 is very annoying to deal with. That's why after e3, I recommend you to always go bishop d3. However, my opponent has played the move c5, uh, which c5 is a very common mistake, especially for this rating. And uh, it's uh, punished by the move knight to b5, which is the Excalibur knight. Now, I have already showed you how to play with that uh, in the previous episode. So I'm debating whether to go for knight b5 again or play dc5 and try to show you how to play this pawn structure. Yeah, I think just for variety purpose, I'm going to go dc5 right now, although knight b5 was the better move. So basically when you do dc5, it's just going to be, uh, we're going to stick with this uh, type of development. So bishop d3, knight f3 castle. We're going to do that. This is always how you set up your pieces against... Uh, bad bishop and then we're gonna have a key move so let's see i expect the 96 castle or some 96 bishop d6 this would be i'd say fairly common although yeah if he wants he can do d4 or some craziness yeah he goes bishop d6 so uh bishop d6 giving us an uh, interesting decision because uh, we can definitely take go knight f3 castle and then break with e4. But we can also play knight f3 and let him take. Huh? Which one do you guys want to see? Mm, I feel like you're a little bit afraid of allowing the double pawn. So I kind of want to... Yeah, I want to see what's the problem with that. I'm going to be your therapist uh, with double pawns. So, tell me, what's the relationship with your father like? I'm just gonna castle. And we're also setting up a very nasty trap. Because he may think that bishop, uh, I mean e5, uh, wins a piece. But e5, I think, does not win a piece. For a very kind of uh, cute idea. I'm just hoping he takes and then we get to maneuver him around in this structure, which is actually one of my favorites. It's really one of the main reasons of why I wake up in the morning, but uh, he seems to be unwilling to give me that. Uh, I'm going to insist. Please. Yes. Okay. No. Uh, he didn't take. He played d5. But he's falling for the trap because he's very likely to go e4. <laughs> and that's going to be losing quite quickly. e4 looks like it's winning a piece. I cannot really blame him. But... Yeah, maybe let's say you can take this as an exercise, pause the video and uh, try to think about, okay, why the heck are we not losing? Or maybe your favorite YouTuber has just went insane. Okay, assuming you pause the video. I think the way to start is bishop takes on d6. Because, yeah, whatever piece he takes, then we can keep and he's worse. I think he's going to be worse because the king is trapped in the middle. And now we have the key move. Because the queen is undefended. So we can take advantage of that by... Uh, bishop takes on e4. Whoopsie. There's going to be uh, a little bit of a pin along the d-file. And uh, taking with the knight also doesn't change much. And White is completely winning out of the opening simply because of that. Isn't it crazy how many traps we have in the Jabava London? I mean, this wasn't even something that I was planning to play for. This was, uh, yeah, I already told you initially I would have preferred to play 
Knight b5 getting the Excalibur Knight, but I wanted to show you the double pawns. We're gonna have to talk about that a little bit later in the video. So my opponent uh, did not allow it, but we got a very nice little idea. I mean, take this with a grain of salt. I don't want you to uh, play only thinking about this trick and dreaming about it because it's uh, honestly pretty rare. Especially if you find yourself uh, below like 1500. Um, this one not really happen on a regular basis. But it was an important idea that uh, you have to be aware of. Okay. That's at least that we can say. Yeah. Okay, so queen b4 is going uh, cave exploring with a queen. Uh, that's pretty dangerous. Uh, I don't like caves generally. Okay, so I'm just going to take, I'm giving him that. He probably has to do bishop e6 just to not get uh, immediately blown off the board with knight d6 and then takes on f7. So yeah, he finds it. Good find by him. Now, it's important to not shut your brain off by playing queen d6 because that leaves the e4 knight undefended. So I think firstly, we got to check. I don't want to retreat with queen d3 because that gives him... Uh, takes or some rook d8 i want to keep up the momentum wait can i keep the, keep up the momentum without uh losing knight d6 that should be good because on king e7 there's like knight f5 but then king f6 that line is getting very weird Oh, never mind. <laughs> I thought queen b5 is like a genius way to save the pawn. Because if he takes the queen, I have knight d6 winning back the queen. But the problem with queen b5 is that he has queen e4. Then after queen b7, he can just castle. And we're just losing a piece. No good, no good, no good. Come on. How do we win? Chess was supposed to be easy with extra pawn in particular uh i don't know i mean do i have to just play simple move queen d3 maybe i'm just gonna play simple move and see what it is i didn't want it to give him uh, rook d8 but i'm gonna play knight d4 and i still have extra pawn i have two pawns currently so i definitely afford to lose a pawn and then still keep another one so yeah rook d8 happens knight d4 i have to save my queen and uh, defend the knight simultaneously so this is pretty much only move and it's very nice that if he takes our uh, rook actually ends up activating the rook is currently uh not completely there, staring into the e3 pawn, but it has prospects. So. Okay, he castled. Now, I would love to trade and then offer a trade, but the same issue my knight drops. So maybe can I start with queen c3 just because there's not going to be the same tactic. And after a take, stakes with a knight, we're losing a pawn. But then after rook d one we keep pretty good control of the position. So I think this is a very clever investment. Just, uh, you know, whenever you're having extra material, you look for trades. So I think it's very wise to sacrifice a pawn just to kind of uh, clear out the whole picture. I'd much rather be up a, a clean pawn with simple moves rather than have two extra pawns and position that's difficult to coordinate. So, yeah, if your pieces don't have, let's say, very obvious squares, it's pretty easy to get in trouble, uh, even if you have the extra material. So I'm just hoping, uh, yeah, he trades. If he does not, then, I mean, I just made huge progress with this queen c3 move because I unpinned. We could trade knights next. But he should definitely take his chance. Now, a very grave error would be to go bc3. Being materialistic, trying to save the pawn, not lose it, but you're completely compromising your queen side structure. So I just think in a position like that, let's say he could go 
maybe something like uh, 95 and then rook c8 and he starts piling up pressure on the c file i'm not sure if you're really that clearly better anymore sure you're like two extra pawns but no good so queen a4 and as uh, usual whenever your opponent uh, avoids uh, trades that will uh, immediately backfire because it means he's allowing juicy squares for their pieces so knight c5 i can further activate and uh, kind of question his uh, whole bloodline with knight c5 i get to talk a little bit with his ancestors on e6 come on opponent what are you gonna do with that fork? Okay, so see, now he's giving me queen trade, but he's also losing the rook. How kind. This is just typical Canadian hospitality. I'm gonna start by taking... Oh man, I missed an easier win even. I just uh, got a little bit... Uh... <laughs> I got a blind spot from the fork, but... Uh... Yeah, anyways, I'll show you what the easier win was. In a second, now I get the fork, we get to collect the rook. Yeah, I can really escape it. I'm gonna then bring rooks onto uh, the open files. Okay, rook d2. Taking the rook. He wants to take... Uh, so, you can definitely make this move and then kick out the rook. But your first instinct shouldn't be to go passive. Your first instinct should be, okay, how can I sacrifice this pawn while activating my rook so you really want to prioritize something like rook d1 takes and then rook on the seventh rank you want to get this important habit in the conversion because you could potentially instead of defending a pawn maybe win two and you just become more active or you want to think of rook b1 and if he plays b6 you go rook b2 and compared to rook on c1 the rook on b2 would also have an attacking function not only defensive uh, so that would be better, but rook c1, just concrete good move here, because I'm forcing exchange of rooks after. If he keeps, his rook is getting trapped, so that's why rook c1 was to be preferred, because I knew for sure we're threatening to exchange his rook, and then the knight alone is simply going to be pointless against the rook in the endgame. So uh, yeah, don't go for checks. Checks are tempting, but you should uh, really not think about the king right now, because we're not going to mate, but think about... Uh, Let's say uh, where the cheese is. So you can see the cheese is on the queen side. So you go rook d7. These are the targets. Now his knight entered the passive position. And uh, okay, next step. Uh, why are we so much better? We have these two pawns. So you push these pawns and then uh, you bring your king. Kind of to d4. Goes g5. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I can already think of rook h7 and win this pawn. I'm just gonna do g3, prepare f4, and then bring the king. Notice that the knight is frozen, because it has to protect the b7 pawn, but now we can advance. And uh, yeah, just uh, rook is nicely cutting away his king, and uh, kind of the dream scenario would be to push, push pawns all the way to the 6th rank, like this bring the king somewhere close and then try to play for a mating net this would be the easiest so yeah time to bring the king maybe something along these lines yeah heading towards his king i don't want to like go greedy i just want to watch out for forks so let's say if i go king g4 i'm looking for forks i don't see a fork um so i could play it could also push pawns. Yeah, I think I'm going to push pawns. Probably easiest. Push the pawn all the way to maybe e6. And then bring its brother. So yeah, pawn e6. And then I want to go f5, f6. Yeah, so he goes there. Um, there was a threat to check him. And he couldn't come close. And then e7 was promoting. So he played king f8. Now f5. Allowing knight e5, but then the rook can uh, go away easily. So let's say uh, rook b7, keeping an eye on his pawn. He defends, but now he allows f6 with a checkmating threat. And yeah, we get to force the knight onto the back rank, followed by... You can do f7, pick up the knight, you can play for Zugzwang. I'm just going to play for Zugzwang here, showcasing that he doesn't have any good moves. So... 
yeah, he's still in Zugzwang. I'm gonna do King H5. He's pinned. Just to show you that uh, in end games, Zugzwang is a pretty nice theme. Okay, now he wants to take, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take and uh, okay. Can we win by Zugzwang? No, I'm gonna have to promote. Okay. Okay. He's gonna do something and then we mate on f7. Nice! Alright! Now, this is gonna be only for the true fans that made it this far into the video because uh, I saved the best game for last. This is gonna be the cherry on top of the cake. Let's see what happened. Alright everybody, back at the office facing a 1800 rated opponent from... What it seems to be Indonesia? Oh, wow. Look at that. Somebody's getting good with the flags. Okay, so knight c3. Uh, pretty much forcing him to go d5. Therefore allowing a job of a London. So, uh, yeah. We're going to take that opportunity and go for it. And uh, he plays e6. Locking the bishop inside the pawn chain. And now uh, already we have a choice. Um, my favorite move, uh, let's say, for beginners is to go e3. But there is also a possibility to play knight b5 in this position, targeting the pawn and either misplacing his knight or forcing bishop d6, losing the bishop uh, pair. So, uh, yeah, in the course we're gonna have uh, both, but uh, yeah, e3, by far the move we wanna get started with. So e3, notice that we delay the move knight f3. I know that's kind of natural to play, like developing and so on, but uh, yeah, you always want to do e3 first, and then uh, you want to do bishop d3. It's important with the move order. If you just get uh, used to it this way, your technique in the long run is going to improve uh, so much better against all the setups, because uh, I know it may not be very obvious why, but... Uh, for instance, if he would have been, then you have knight on f3, already you can be in trouble with knight e4. With the bishop on d3 first, you're always gonna be safe. So just do this setup literally all the time. I could have got knight b5, but uh, that was not winning right away, because he still can play the move bishop d6. Uh, yes, we can take and be better, but I'm trying to show you this simple way of playing uh, bishop d3. He goes for the pin, which I'm really glad, because uh, a lot of people are kind of afraid of this uh, move in general. So I'm gonna go knight f3. Important. As long as... Uh, oh, we actually get to deal with uh, what I was mentioning earlier. Um, yeah, so uh, on knight e4, we have many ways of playing. Uh, I think I'm gonna go for the gambit and the castle, but before we do that, I wanted to quickly mention... Uh, I noticed a bit of a common mistake when bishop lands on b4, people overly play this knight e2. Which, yeah, it could be clever if you know for sure opponent plans to take, but if he doesn't take, your knight ends up being a bit misplaced. So for that reason, I prefer knight f3. 80% of the time, you just go knight e2 if you're running the risk of losing a pawn on c3, only if it's like a must. Otherwise, I'm not afraid of... Uh, the double pawns, because uh, the double pawns are actually a strength in that position. If opponent takes, he's pretty much giving you dynamite. Because you can use the double pawns to push, go c4, take on d5 twice. And you can pretty much go for a structure where you trade the c pawns for his central pawns. Pretty much he's going to have a position without a strategic foundation, because he's not going to be able to fight for the center anymore. Um... That's a little bit getting into the nitty-gritty of this, but uh, I wanted to clear out that little detail. And now it's very strong to uh, sacrifice the pawn. No matter how he takes, we're going to have great compensation. If you are not comfortable to give up the pawn, uh, bishop takes on e4, followed by knight d2 was the easier route. Uh, but uh, yeah, I wanted to show you this. So I'm going to take... He took with the bishop, so we already have a bishop pair as a compensation uh, in the long run. Um, in the past, I've had uh, games also where they've taken with the knight. Uh, oops, let me just quickly showcase that. Where people end up taking with the knight, then with the bishop, 
we have to play rook b1 and then they make the mistake of castling so uh please feel free to pause the video and think about uh, what would you play in that position because uh, you can take advantage of the great gift so bishop takes on h7 king takes and then uh knight g5 king moves somewhere and then queen d3 is nice this time queen d3 is very strong because it's hitting the bishop on c3 and also threatening mate on h7 so you at least win back the piece and also keep a big attack against the enemy king uh now for some reason he decided not to grab the pawn i mean if he was taking i think i would have played the queen e1 a bit of a weird move but the point is i know he will return to e4 and I don't want to get my queen hit by the knight. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, there are many ways to play. There is a long-term move, c4, rook b1. But we can also just play knight e5 and then kick the knight with f3. And we have a uh, good compensation because he lost uh, control over the dark squares for the rest of the game. And his bishop is uh, very passive. Now, after f5, we're going to use uh, what I told you earlier. We're going to use the dynamite. Basically, we're just looking to trade these kind of marginal pawns for his central pawns. So, to kind of give you a little bit of a better idea uh, about this. Uh, okay, generally, you can think of normal pawns uh, being worth uh, one point. And I would say uh, the central pawns are worth... Uh, one point and a quarter. I would say if you keep that detail in mind, uh, it will really elevate your game uh, in the long run. And okay. It was G5. Okay. I mean, at the very least, I have Bishop E5. Worst case scenario, I could play Bishop G3. I'm not afraid of this. Question is, uh, okay. Do we have tactics like taking whatever way or do we have intermediate move? Because we could start by taking, removing the defender of g5 and then pick it up. But bishop e4, I assume he wants gf. And that is not as clear as I would uh, like. Or at least, yeah, at first glance. Uh, if I take with a knight, that seems clever because there is queen h5. It looks like it wins back the knight, but he can actually hide with knight f7. So that as well is not super uh, satisfying satisfactor that is not a word it's not super convenient let's just say uh okay almost a brain fart in english okay uh all right let's keep it simple go bishop e5 yeah just uh gonna be using the outpost um and we're actually gonna get a permanent knight on e5 which uh already that's just uh winning us the game strategically so this is actually going to be a very important uh, idea to have in mind because in general, you are kind of used to uh, win games because you are up a pawn or because your opponent hangs the queen, let's say, <laughs> to make it more uh, broad. But uh, no, just by taking. And now we have knight on the dark squares and his only remaining minor piece is on light squares only. So you can never really get rid of that knight. So just because of that, if you sit on the position, you're going to be completely winning. Uh, even pieces, doesn't matter. Just by applying simple, fundamental, strategic ideas, uh, this position is completely winning. Now, uh, okay. We just need to open it up for a little bit. Because in general, whenever you have these strategic advantages, you need to... Uh, open up the second front let's say or combine it with something so it's strong knight plus weak king or strong knight plus uh, attack on the queen side in order to be able to break through so uh okay there is f3 move a hook there is c5 c4 i'm looking maybe a way for him to try to destabilize my position would be to break with c5 although i can always play c3 if i want to i could do c5 just be kind of annoying yeah i think i'm gonna do c5 just creating this dark square bind because queen d5 always gets kicked out by c4 so that's not a problem and yeah i think now we go for f3 i could also go f4 
but it doesn't really matter since he can take against both. So I'm going to do f3, idea to take, so probably he is going to be forced into capturing. Uh, and then I think I'm just going to take back with the queen, developing, connecting rooks. Uh, yeah, looking to... Does it make sense to actually ever take with the g-pawn? Hmm. So this could be interesting if I ever plan to use the g-file for an attack. I feel like it's a little bit too subtle. I don't think we sh really need that. So yeah, I'm just going to keep it simple. Take with the queen. Keeping the open file as well. Uh, g4 already losing for him due to a small trick. So you can try to pause the video. There it is. <laughs> pause the video. Why is g4 uh, losing? Otherwise, you know, I, I could have considered playing g4 myself and pressuring this. Plus rook b1 and even an exchange sack. A bit unnecessary, but maybe not completely idiotic to consider. But g4, the problem is that he's uh, overloaded. And I have just knight takes and... Uh, okay, I mean, yes, he doesn't have to take, but I'm just going to go back with the knight and he's going to have the same issue where we have the immortal knight on e5 and uh, then we also got the extra pawn. So, yeah, we can just enter uh, trading mode, start exchanging all the pieces, but... Might as well go for a mating attack, depending on the day. I don't know. I feel like I I, I want to go a little bit more aggressive. I feel like uh, I'm in the mood to get in an argument with somebody at the grocery store. So I might as well get rid of that by attacking my opponent. Unless he resigns. <laughs> he might as well resign. You never know. Okay, queen g6. Okay, so knight. Knight is going over there. And uh, yeah, in order to mate, we need to bring the rook somehow there is a uh, opportunity of a rook lift on the g file because uh, he no longer has a pawn so for that uh, i i'm gonna have to move the queen away queen f4 and then notice how we could try to place uh, all of our pieces on the dark squares and he's unable to really challenge them and okay he goes queen g5 Okay, I have to speed up. Uh, I can't really waste any time because we don't have... We have only a minute left and it would be a huge pity to miss this. The point is, if he wants b6 to activate, pause the video. What would he play? A very important move if he wants to go b6 and activate. Uh, having he played b6, you don't take. He wants bishop b7, so for that you close the window, you play c6. And if he goes a5, bishop a6, well, you can close the window with c4 and the bishop is always stuck. In this move, I'm not really concerned. Yes, he's going to try h4, but that pawn is going to be vulnerable there. So, might as well start uh, attacking, because that's the thing with pawns. The more they advance, the more vulnerable they become. So, I think I'm going to do queen f2 first, setting up this. Try to win it. If he goes rook f6, uh, idea rook h6 to save the pawn. I'm probably going to even have e4 ideas. Uh, to open up the situation, but also just rook h3 and then retreating move knight f3 wins the pawn. I don't really feel like uh, giving up uh, such a monster piece just to win a pawn. But we'll see. Could also play g3. Yeah, he might do rook h6. Uh, we're actually very likely to get that on the board. Uh, I could also do king h1. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to do king h1 with idea rook g1, g3 to open up the file. And he never gets to put pressure for the same uh, b6, c6 idea. Critical uh, move to keep his bishop, bishop locked. Uh, also notice he cannot develop normally because the knight captures and... Well, how is he gonna yeah, get any pieces? Yeah, he tries it, but... Yeah, okay, this is pointless. I'm covering all the squares, so just rook g1, g3. No need for playing c4 even. I could do it, but I don't have to. I wanna do g3. Maybe I should have uh, played this uh, king h1, rook g1 idea a little bit... Uh, 
earlier it just uh, took me a minute uh, to figure it out um okay i think i can do it rook uh, g8 takes also i just uh, forgot there is uh, knight f7 but i still wanna kind of wanna keep my strong knight Okay, I want to trade all the pieces. So I'm taking with the rook and then I'm going for the end game. I want to show you the end game with winning knight. We're going to have two extra pawns in the end game. I don't have a lot of time on the clock. I'm pretty sure knight f7 was maybe easily winning, but I want to show you the end game after we trade everything down the g file. How we bring the king and then um, we use the outside passer to create a diversion. So, diversion. I don't know, is that a word? I'm gonna use the outside passer to bait him, let's say. This is gonna be like a thirst trap. For him, okay. This. Bring the king, if bishop a4 we save with c4. Could also play c3 to have my pawns uh, not easily targetable. Also sacrifice a pawn. Also, maybe just this. Yeah, no, just creating a passed pawn by force seems to be really the easiest. D5, he has to take, and then, uh, well, he won't be able to stop us from queening. So, that is really the uh, power of the passed pawns. See? He's gonna take, but then we have c7. Come on, opponent. Do something. He he probably has to sack. Yeah, he sacks. Can I do this? Okay. Yeah, he sacked the bishop because otherwise the bishop didn't have enough mana to stop the pawn. But... Yeah, 12 seconds. I'll have to... Yeah, actually, this guy is going to test my speed a little bit. There is no increment, so I have to really... Remove the hell out of this uh, end game. As long as I keep pre-moving, should be in time, but it depends. Oh. Okay, hope I am not going to do anything uh, silly with the knight. I have to actually be careful. I'm just going to play knight uh, d2 for safety measure. He doesn't push. Yeah, I'm just going to keep it here to sacrifice and then uh, I'm just going to push the pawn. You know what? <laughs> For extra safety measures, I'm going to pre-move knight b3. I'm going to sacrifice the knight because I have the remaining pawns. So, yeah. It's it's tricky when you have the knight uh, and he has passed pawns. Here, obviously, uh, I can stop them, but I can also blunder because I don't have time. To reduce the risk of blundering, I'm just going to let him take that. He doesn't. Okay. Oh, don't stalemate. I must stalemate it. Nice. He resigned. Okay. I genuinely believe that was a very nice strategic game. So you see, Jobafa, we play aggressive, but uh, it's super important to know how to slow down. And that's why... I think a repertoire with Jobava London and Karo Kano's Black, it teaches you to make a perfect balance between aggressive and uh, strategic play. In case you're waiting uh, for my upcoming Jobava London course, uh, make sure to subscribe uh, to the newsletter. Just need to type in your email, alexbanzea.com. You know the drill. Thanks for watching and I'll see you around the channel.